All right. Hello, everybody. I'm not going to stand in the screen there. My name is Amy Johnson, and I am going to be talking to you today about beyond moms, going beyond just the moms in your ministry who, well, you know, they're always there. They're Sometimes they're not always willing, but you know. Maybe this is you. Maybe you're going, hello, help. And you're just standing out there and you're like, it would be really awesome if some people would help me. Do you guys ever feel like that? Like it's just here I am and I have no one. Well, you know what? I am hopefully going to give you some really practical ideas today about how to get awesome leaders. It was really funny because... um, when, when I had got the call, they needed somebody um, to teach this class, and it was just last week, see, so you can't judge me too harshly. And, um, and I was like, I was having a hard time. I'm like, Lord, sometimes I struggle with getting leaders. And I was talking to our church secretary, and I was just going, you know, Kathy, I just don't know if this is the one for me. And she said, are you kidding me? She's like, you can totally do this. She's like, think back to your last event. You had, you know, 65 leaders from, you know, ages 70 down to... 12, you you can do this. I'm like, okay. So I sat and I racked my brain, and this is what I have come up with on finding leaders. First of all, sometimes we're feeling overwhelmed, unsupported, and we just need help. There's always moms there. There's always some mom that's there because she feels obligated. Um, I would love it if we could get in our churches to get beyond obligation to get beyond the leaders that have to be there because they have a kid in the ministry and maybe I don't know I've heard of churches I don't do this at mine but I've heard of churches that say if you have a kid in children's ministries you need to volunteer once a month have any of you guys ever used that I don't do that I've actually chosen to get away from that because I found is what I was getting was moms that didn't want to be there and that is not who I want in my kids ministry so um They're not always our best choice. Sometimes they are amazing. Sometimes the moms that you have, man, they are your go-to girls. I think about um, Michelle and Tina, two of my, over the years, they've kind of become some of my best friends even, and they are there whenever I need them. Their kids, they're on moms, their kids aren't even in my children's ministries anymore. They're too old, but they are still there plugging away, building sets for me during playtime, or um, I have one mom, Michelle, she has a cricket. (laughs) That thing is awesome. She can make anything on that thing, and she does, you know, bulletin boards and displays for me. You know, um, even my pastor had commented on, you're making some really cool displays lately. Like, I had done some really fun things. I'm like, yeah, that's called Michelle's Cricket. It's awesome. I look like I just make letters really well. So, um, but maybe it's time to um, to start going beyond the moms in our ministry. And I'm going to tell you, this a couple years ago is where where I came to. I began to launch a campaign. It began, I need you. Jesus needs you. These kids need you. And I began to build a a plan on how to get these leaders in. So who makes a good leader? Who are you trying to target? Number one, energetic dads, loving dads make great leaders. Um, The divorce rate in our area is huge. And a lot, and and not only just the divorce rate, but just moms who have kids who don't have dads at home, a lot of these kids, they have no father figure in their life. And I am blessed beyond belief to have a husband who has joined with me, and he is there every week, whether he's playing the guitar and leading worship, or leading games, or he is Mr. Fun. I mean, I've had a lot of the kids over the years tell me, well, you're the one who teaches us, and he's the one who's fun. Dads are fun. Bring them on. Um, I, I, found, um, I found this, and I, I'll come back to this in a second, but I, I think it's the next slide. I found this, and I just thought, daddies do it different. There's a book. It's a book. And I thought, isn't that the truth, that dads have a different way? And I watched the way that my daughter, and my sons for that matter, leap up when, when dad gets home. You know, the way my daughter runs into his arm, the way she wants him to dance with her around the room, the way she looks up to him and admires him. Doesn't every little girl deserve to have some dads in their life? And if she doesn't have one that's for real, let's find a volunteer one for her because it's important. Okay, so dads. Dads are awesome. Next, the youth of our church make incredible leaders. Now, you need to have a plan with that. You need to have a code of conduct that you expect them to follow. That's important. And... um. 
Um, I won't go all into it. That was a whole nother class. But, but you, you can utilize them, and they are amazing. They will do great things for you. I am blessed to have two sons, actually, one of them who is here, who do so much for me. I mean, it is, it is nothing for me to hand us in paper on Sunday morning and said, hey, I need you to lead this small group. Or, dude, the sound guy isn't here. Can you please run sound for me? Or, you know, I, I'm really careful. I try to get, I've gotten better. I used to be horrible about making sure that my son gets into the adult service or attends an, another service during the week so that I'm not overusing him. Don't overuse your students because they need to be fed too. But use them because um, the kids relate to them. They have more energy than I do, and they are just awesome. So we need to take advantage of what God has given us. It's incredible leaders who are youth. Um, all right, and I start them actually at fifth grade. At fifth grade, they're a student leader, and they can do a lot of small things. I mean, they really can. They come early and put on my chairs. They help clean up. They do menial stuff, but not just that. Sometimes, I mean, I've been known to put a really strong sixth grader in charge of a small group if I'm missing a leader. And I have a couple of them who I can do that. You know who they are. You know those ones that could take on a, a group of students just as easy as their 25-year-old girl down the road. You know, it... You have them. Just look for them. All right. Young, kidless couples. Awesome. They're like that one who they're getting ready to embark on life. Maybe they're going to have kids soon. You know, um, they're awesome because they are not tied to a lot. They are tied to each other, and so they normally want to work as a team, which is awesome because it lets them see what future parents look like. It lets them see what people who love God and love each other look like. It's great. The more we can model positive things for our kids, the better. But those young, kidless couples make really fun leaders. Able-bodied grandparents make fabulous leaders. I do not know how I would staff my nursery if I did not have those able-bodied grandparents. I mean, I, and I think about, um, well, I'll tell stories in a minute because I'm getting there. <laughs> young single college students awesome, awesome. And most of them don't have anything going on on Sunday. It's their day to catch up on homework or do whatever. And I've really learned that they're there for you and they are there for you during events and they drive. I remember it was so awesome. Um, every, <laughs> every VBS or um, like a couple of times we've done our VBS at night or anytime I do um, a big outreach, I always have a person who's just mine. That might sound selfish, but I have an intern, my own personal assistant. I call them my personal assistant, and they love it. They, like, want to be it. And um, that person needs to have a driver's license because they need to be able to run to the store if I need something for a game that got forgot to get bought. Or this is going to sound really crazy, but and maybe a little selfish, but sometimes I just need Starbucks, you know? And you're just going, and you're like, who is that person? And you just say, for me, it's been, you know, over the years I've had Emily and I've had Amber and I've had Gabby and these girls who I'm like, dude, you need star I need Starbucks. And that they're comfortable, <laughs> they're comfortable and trustworthy. Because I hand them my credit card and they go and everybody know I, I live in a small town, so it's like nobody even has a, an issue with it. And it's awesome. So um yeah, those young college students rock. All right, we did that one already. All right. So this is what we need to remember when we are placing and say you have these four people and they are your new recruits. You are excited about them and they are ready to work for you. Remember the, remember this, fit people into their skill sets. And um, this is really important. I'm going to talk about a few personal stories in just a few minutes, but I have this guy, his name's Ed and Ed is awesome. He is 70, about 70. Um, he's a retired architect, and he's very meticulous. He builds things and makes things. And there have been a couple of times, like one day I just said, man, I would really like to have not just your stupid little buy-at-the-store beanbag tosses. I'm like, I want some cool beanbag tosses. He made me these really cool beanbag tosses and proceeded for our carnival event where we had almost 500 kids at this last carnival event he made me these awesome beanbag things. He made this, like, can thing that, oh, I don't know. He just made cool stuff. Everybody needs an Ed. 
You need to find that guy in your church. I'm sure there is that, there is that guy, that lonely guy out there who wants to be plugged in. He wants to be used, but maybe he really doesn't like children. Maybe he doesn't want to work with them. He doesn't want to be that hands-on, get-in-the-classroom kind of guy. And for Ed, he's losing his hearing a bit, and so that's not the place for him. But that man is my go-to guy. And so what do I do? I make sure that I buy him Starbucks. And I make sure that I take care of him, and I let him know, you know what, I appreciate you, Ed. And um, he has just, we're building a new nursery at our church, and he has, he's a retired architect. So he has taken this to a whole new level. He spends hours at the church every week. Well, his wife volunteers for mops, so when she's in doing mops, he's in doing stuff in the nursery, and he made, he drew up all the blueprints. He did everything for so cheap, and not that that's what it's about, because we would have been willing to pay a person. It's not about finding someone who will do it cheap. It's about finding someone who wants to, wants to do it. That's the key. So um, fit people into their skill sets. It's huge. Number two, you have to ask people. The phone is your best friend. And now, I hate talking on the phone. I really do. It is not my favorite thing. I love texting. Texting is awesome. Now, some of your older people, they don't text, you know? And now, a lot of the people my age don't text. As soon as you know you reach that 40 and above, we are a little bit computer illiterate. But I personally like it because it made life easier for me. It's so much, you know, a 30-second text or what will turn into a 30-minute phone call. It's crazy. I don't have that kind of time. So that sounds insensitive, but you know what I mean. It's awesome. But those, there are some people that need you to call them. And if you want good leaders, you got to take the time. you got to put in the effort. you got to do the work. It is hard. It's a pain in the butt, but you got to do it. All right. Um, do not overwhelm them to start with. I know that it's really, and how many of you guys have more than one service? Yeah, you guys are kind of lucky in one aspect. You can use somebody and they can still go to church. And that is a good thing. But you have double the services to get people for. And that is really, that's a lot of work. So one thing, I was talking to Shelly about this actually just a few minutes ago and she said, make sure you let people know who have, um, multiple services, don't be afraid to ask somebody to commit more than once a month because they can go to another service. So if you are fortunate enough to have that, that ability to use somebody who's awesome more than once, she actually has, I think she said his name's Mark, she actually has Mr. Mark who commits to every week. He does the kids' service and then he goes to church. And it's rewarding for him, and he loves it. He's committed. She's like, and those kids would be devastated if he left. They love him. So, you know, being willing to, there are people out there that are willing to do it. But don't overwhelm somebody in the beginning. Start small. That once a month thing, it works great for getting somebody plugged in in the beginning. Um, I have my people on a once a month rotation, except my movers and shakers, the preschoolers group. And sometimes preschoolers, if you know preschoolers, they don't do real great with change. And if they know who's going to be their teacher, it, it really cuts down on the, the hardship of dropping them off. So I actually have two ladies. Their names are both Miss Kim, and they rotate back and forth. So one goes to service, one does kids' church, and we, we do rotate the student leaders that are in there. And really, she's the only adult in there. She may have, you know, probably about 20 kids in there. And, um, but she is constant, and preschoolers love consistency. It makes them happy. Your older kids, maybe it matters to them, but they don't, it, they don't seem to be as phased by it. Now, Rob and I are, you know, we're kind of a constant in there, so those leaders that we have, we do we rotate them once a month, and I would love to have an every other month rotation. I would, but it does also kind of make them not as ready when they get there. If they know that they're the first Sunday of every month, it kind of adds this, they know what they're doing, you know? And then also remember to educate them. Let them know what you expect of them. Have a meeting occasionally. Um, some, sometimes I'm not so good at this. I know what I'm supposed to do. But, you know, I get these group of women and we've, or men, and we become kind of this close little family. And 
I end up doing a lot of personal and individual meetings. And if I would do one big meeting, it would probably cut down a lot of time. But I think me personally, I'm a one-on-one -on -one girl. And so I love to go and sit and have coffee with them. Any excuse to have coffee, right? <laughs> That's bad. Anyway, but um, you go and you have that one-on-one -on -one with them, and they feel like they're important. Now, there is absolutely nothing wrong with you know, killing 25 birds with one stone. It is a great way to go. I wish that I was that person. I wish that, and, and I do do that a couple times a year, but my monthly checkups are, are often just a coffee date. All right, um, here's a big one, and I, I've, seen this, I've seen this happen in people in, in their ministry where it becomes this, and I think I hit this another time, so when you hit it again, just know I'm really trying to get this point across. Um, nobody wants to help me. Well, you work in children's ministries because, man, it just stinks. I'm the only one ever there, and I just, I just don't even know. It's so hard, you know, and you're going, <laughs> run away, you know, because, you know, they have a really unhappy children's ministries. If, if you can't sell it, if you can't make it attractive, oh, my goodness, we are doing this event, and you are not cool if you are not there. And maybe you're not going to use those words. But um, like I said, we just did our fall carnival. And um, I was expecting 300 students to, um, to be there, for I knew I needed 50 leaders. And what did we do? Me and my, my pastor's wife, we got on the phone and we started to call people. And we called almost the entire congregation. I'm not even kidding. And um, I'm not going to lie, she did most of it. But praise Jesus for her, right? So um, you, you get on the phone and you make these calls. And maybe you have person who works really closely with you that is chatty and loves the phone and they're sitting around and they're not doing anything and maybe that person will make those phone calls for you maybe they have more time than you have and that's awesome but if you don't have that person it used to always be me I didn't have somebody in the first you know five six seven eight years of ministry I didn't have anybody to make phone calls for me so what did I do I made those phone calls now after making those phone calls, people stick, man. And you make your, your ministry look attractive, and it sticks. And people will want to be a part of what's happening. It's like a contagion. And then those people stick around, and then they bring in new people. And sometimes people leave. You know, their kids are out of ministry, and they, they move on to youth, or they move on to the next thing. And you know what? That is okay. I used to really think, oh, my goodness, what would I do if so-and-so left? Have you ever felt like that? If so-and-so ever leaves, I am messed up. I'm going to die, you know? But God brings the next person along. He really does. I mean, I think of my leaders now. Some of them have only been in ministry for three or four years. What did I do before them? Well, somebody else was in that position, and they were great too, and I thought, what would I do without them? God will bring the people, and remember, he's in control of it. Spend a lot of time in prayer. Pray before you get on the phone. If it's somebody who you're like, oh, they'd be awesome. I know they have a busy life, but they would be great. Pray before you get on the phone. Lord God, if this is what you want, I need this person. And it will work out. And then eventually, the work gets easier. You work hard in the beginning, and then pretty soon, you're able to expand yourself out into um, a whole new realm of what I want to accomplish in my ministry. You're able to take on new ideas of what you want to do. And it was funny because just last night when the speaker was speaking, um, I was talking to my son and I said, oh my goodness, I had this really awesome idea for what God wants us to do in children's ministries. And he's like, I had a really cool idea too. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to tell you. And I proceeded to tell him and he looks at me. He's like, mom, that was my exact idea. And I thought, well, that's a God thing then. And you know what my first thought was? That means we have to find workers for it, you know? And, but it was like this peace of mind that, you know what, it's going to be okay. Because, and I told my son, I said, but we have some, some really smart youth. And starting a tutoring program after school is, is this thing that just it popped in my head. I'm like, I want to do this. I want to make this happen. And I'm like, you know what? We have incredible high schoolers. I have honor roll students on my team. You know, they just might need a little bit of training. I used to be a teacher. I can do this. You know, and so with, with a minimal amount of adults and some great, awesome students, I'm like, we can launch this new thing that may be just what our community needs to let them know that we love them beyond trying to cram Jesus down their throat. But we'll show them Jesus, and we'll be Jesus, and we will show them. And 
but what's your first, anytime you get an idea, what's your first thing, but how am I going to find leaders for it? You know, and that can be the biggest discouragement. That can just make you want to quit. When you show up and you're the only one and maybe you have one other person you, and your person in your nursery class is exhausted and tired too and everybody's burnt out, what do you do from there? You find more people and you sell it and you make it look attractive. All right, promo videos are awesome. If you can get your pastor on your team, um, I'm telling you some of my promo videos, like we'll, we'll do a promo video or we'll do it right after an event and we'll show them how fun it was. And then the next year, right before the event, we'll show that same promo video. And it's that same event from last year, but all of a sudden they're like, that's right, that looked fun. I thought that would be fun to be a part of. And then they sign up. It works. It really does. And you may, on, you may get only five new people from it for your next event, but that's five people that you did not have before. And those five people thought it looked cool. And those five people are signing up because they want to. And having five people there who want to be there versus 10 people who don't, there is a huge difference because they're on the ball. They want to be there. They're excited. They have passion about it. And it works. Another thing, build team spirit. Make your team at church be the best team. You know, um, I am blessed to work with an awesome an awesome team of pastors who my pastor, my lead pastor, he has my back. He is on my side. He loves kids. And I come up with some crazy ideas, things that I want to do. And he just most of the time encourages me and says, okay, how are we going to make it happen? Or he may have a, a great idea and say, this is my idea, and I want you to make it happen. And it goes both ways. If, if I look at him and balk his ideas, then I'm not having team spirit. <laughs> and I say, oh, I don't really want to do that. No, I adopt that idea, and I get on board, and I make it happen with excellence, just as if it were my own. And then... At the same time, he jumps behind my ideas. And even if he doesn't think they're, they're the best, he encourages me. Like, I don't have any fear of going to my pastor and saying, okay, I'm going to need a little bit of money, and I'm going to need the church on this day, and I'm going to need. And I know that he will support and encourage me because I support and encourage him back. Build team spirit. When they see that trickling down from the tops, if they see dissension within your team at the upper level, if you don't like your, your children's pastor or say you are the children's pastor and you are not meshing with your, your head pastor, work it out because you can't live in that. You will be so, I've been there. You can't function in that. It drags you down. It's like, it's like carrying a weight everywhere you go. So work it out. All right, keep your leaders happy. Small little gifts and lots of love and hugs. I make sure every, every Sunday morning, even if I am super busy, I will make it to every one of my classrooms. I will talk to every teacher. I will say good morning to them. Or if, if I'm not going to be there, I will have a note and some candy waiting for them when they get there. Let them know, I'm thinking about you. You were, not, you were on my mind before I saw you this morning. You know, that says a lot. It says a lot to me. If I know somebody is thinking about me and I didn't even, you know, and they hadn't even seen me yet this morning, it's like a, a student bringing you a picture that they drew at home. You know, there's the 25 kids that bring you the picture that they drew that was the picture that you put out that morning and you know that they colored it at church. And that's great. They were excited to see you and they're happy. But that child who made you a picture at home and cut things out and glued it and brought this for you, there is something special there that says, I thought about you when I didn't, when you weren't in front of my face. That's what we need to do to our leaders. You will keep them. They will be excited to work for you if you keep, if you encourage them. All right. Alone, we can do so little. I love Helen Keller, <laughs> but together we can do so much. I'm, I'm a big Helen Keller fan. Every year I have to throw Helen Keller into my sermon somewhere. She has such an inspirational life, but it's true. And, um, it's easy sometimes, and I am guilty of this, it's easy to say, you know what, I can just do it myself. I'll just do it myself. I'll just do it myself. You know what ends up happening? Your family ends up doing it with you. There were years <laughs> where I brought home 40,000 Easter eggs, and my family sat in front of the TV and stuffed every one of them. I, you know, they, they end up getting you out of bind after bind after bind. Does that get old after a while? Yeah, I know, right? I have a great family. But then I started saying, hey, you know what? On Wednesday and Thursday after school, any of you guys who want to take the bus to the church 
after school, either work it out for your parents to pick you up here, or I will give you a ride home. If you can make it to the church, we are going to stuff 40,000 Easter eggs. You be here. And they show up. And pretty soon, the church secretary is down there sitting on the floor stuffing, church, stuff, stuffing eggs with you because we want to get it done. And what took six hours of stuffing at my house takes an hour and a half when you suddenly have 12 people doing it. It's amazing. I mean, the same thing I think about um, the shoe boxes. You know, when you, I did that with shoe boxes. I was, um, my budget was buying all the stuff to fill these shoe boxes, and then I was filling them all and showing the kids, oh, look, they're done. Don't ask me whatever happened there. I'm not sure. I was, I was an idiot. Anyway, and then <laughs> one day it was like, hey, kids, you bring the stuff. You come and fill the boxes. And they showed up, and their parents showed up, and they get behind it. And, you know, we are better as a team. That's out of order. Um, team. Together, everyone achieves more. It just works. Okay, I'm running out of time, so really quick, I want to give you guys time for questions. The Hessners, I already talked about them. That is Ed and his wife. Um, they're amazing. Um, Dustin and Derek are my kids. How many of you guys have kids and they do stuff in your ministry? <sighs> They're a blessing. They're, my kids are a blessing. My husband's not on there, but he should be number one. The dude does a lot. Um, but Dustin and Derek do too. And Peyton, my daughter, she does too as she gets older, but she's only eight. And right now she's just enjoying being in kids' church. And that's totally cool. Um, Ethan Six is my son's best friend, and sometimes I feel like he does almost as much as my son does. Not quite. <laughs> but, I mean, the dude rocks. And you just, you, you get these kids, and you've raised them in children's church, and once they know children's church, it's awesome. Utilize them. Um, Preston, he's a single dad. He went through a really rough divorce. His wife had an affair. It was just a really horrible thing. Comes to me, he's like, so does that mean I can never work in in ministry. No, absolutely not. You get in there and now he's working on Sundays. He was my counselor at camp. Sometimes um, we just have to, you have to be willing to let, they're working through issues. People are working through issues, you know, but I'm thankful, so thankful that these people are willing to come and work. They love their kids. They love children. They love God. We give them a place to serve. Maria is um, a college student. And um, actually, she's not. She graduated this last year. Now she's a bank teller, and um, but she's musical. So she plays the piano and, and, and sings for worship team, but she's also a huge asset. Does she ever come in and work with the kids? Not really. Um, she does a little bit during the time if we're putting on a play and stuff like that. But I am artsy, and I love to sing, and I love to build plays and musicals and things like that. And Maria and Jonathan... Um, so yeah, he's on there too. Um, they come in and they make all of my accompaniment tracks. David um, is another one. He plays the guitar and the bass. He comes in and, and, and John plays the drums. They come in, they make all it. We make them live in our church. Saves me hundreds of dollars of buying music. They just come in and they do it and we jam and it's so fun. And we love it. Um, Kim, I already told you about Kim and Kim. They're awesome. They trade back and forth. They're wonderful. The Bruners is an, another family that I thought of that just started to get involved. They were actually children's pastors and music pastors before. They took two years of, or a year and a half, or whatever, of we are not doing anything. Don't ask us. We are on a sabbatical. And then come this last event, they said, you know what? We would like to help. And they're awesome. I see in the years to come that they will be a super asset to our team. But I did never push them. I never pressured them. What does this represent? This represents a 12-year-old and a 15-year-old and a 70-year-old and a 40-year-old and a 25-year-old and two, you know, 60-ish year olds and then, you know, a 28-year-old and some 50-year-olds. It's multi-generational. Your kids need to see multi-generational people working in your children's ministries. You can't pull off from one area. You have to do the work, make the calls, get the generations working together. All right, so um, celebrate your wins publicly. When you have an event and 40 kids get saved, your church needs to know about it. They need to hear it. They need to be able to applaud it. They will support you when they see stuff happening. The same with promo videos. They will support you when they know what's going on.
Don't rant about the hard stuff. No one cares about me. No one will help me. I'm all alone. These aren't going to get you anywhere. You have to have a positive attitude. Be willing to work because in the end, it's the work that's going to pay off. And when you put in the work, it gets easier. That's what's glorious about work. And ask, 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 ask. Let people know what you need. A positive attitude, I love this. A positive attitude may not solve all your problems, but it will annoy enough people that it will make it worth the effort. <laughs> and I love that because I know sometimes I probably get annoying with my asking and my asking, but some people, it's the third time where they finally say, fine, sign me up, and then they end up loving it. Um, present your needs and cool, as cool opportunities. Make them feel like they're gonna miss out if they're not part of your team or your event. You need to shine bright, baby. That's my, you just glow. And if you glow, your ministry will grow. It is just all there is to it. And remember, no man is an island. Number one, you can't do it alone. And I'm sure some of you have tried. You're like that, the wily coyote, and they're going, ah. don't be that. But also remember that the other people out there, they're not islands either. And the person that you're not el asking to help because you think maybe they're not interested or they, well, they would let me know if they wanted to be involved or maybe you think they're too busy, ask them because they may need to be a part of the team even more than you need them as your team member. Never be afraid to ask. God leads, you follow. And then you just trust. You make sure you background check. You make sure that you, you know, if you do references, make sure you talk to their references. You don't want to put somebody inappropriate in an inappropriate place. Fit them to their skill set. You can do this. And that is all I have to say.